Um, uh, thank you everyone for coming and also to the people who will be watching online and following on Twitter, I just realised that will be on YouTube now. <laughs> um, so this is the second in our series of artist talks at Fine Shade. So the artist talks are part of the Outdoor Institute of Art, which is an alternative art school devised by Yasmin Canvin, our previous director. The Outdoor Institute of Art is an alternative art school with a curriculum which consists of discussions, skills, knowledge, sharing events between artists, experts in relevant fields, the arts se sector and members of the public. So tonight's talk is between Justin Carter and Susanna Rialdon. I, might, I don't know, nearly. <laughs> so welcome to you both. So Justin is the second in four residencies here at Fineshade Wood. As part of our two-year programme, the Forest of is the Museum. So we've really enjoyed looking at Justin's work earlier this evening. Um, for those of you who haven't already seen it, we'll be going to see it later on. Um, and that's the work that he's produced in the residency with us. His installation, Blood from Stone, Impressions of Life, is inspired by, I'm just going to read from here, the regional relationship between oak and ore and the forest as a site of ancient industry. And Justin is reader in contemporary practice, art and environment, and lecturer in sculpture and environmental art at Glasgow School of Art. So Susanna is the Roots of Rockingham project officer for the Back from the Brink project, led by the Butterfly Conservation. And she sports a wonderful jacket. Which yeah. <laughs> <coughs> Susanna will discuss the reintroduction of the checkered skipper butterfly, extinct in England since 1976, and the restoration and management of a network of woodland sites across the Rockingham Forest area, creating more habitat with which vulnerable species can thrive. So I just want to explain about the evening. Um, both our speakers will briefly introduce themselves. Susanna will then talk about her work and then Justin would lead us into the exhibition and will be sort of take a more informal take and he'll lead us around his work and as ever audience are welcome to ask any questions and then we'll come back and round off the evening. So I'd like to hand you over to, to start with you, Justin, to briefly introduce amazing. yourself. Oh, <laughs> put me on the spot. <laughs> um, so you want a few words just about who I am. Uh, so Justin Carter, I live in uh, Glasgow and um, just driven down five and a half hours, just literally about a couple of hours ago. So any, uh, anything that I say that isn't entirely making sense, blame it on the car journey. Um, <laughs> As Emma mentioned, I work at Glasgow School of Art. I'm reader of contemporary art, art and environment uh, there, and I also kind of teach full time uh, as well, and manage to kind of fit my practice around often doing residencies as well, which is a great way of making work. Um, I spent, I think, the key thing about understanding, um, I guess, my relationship with you all here is that I did a residency over the summer time, so it's quite an interesting thing showing the work now in the winter, it's a very different feel to the place. And I think it's been quite an interesting um, chance-like thing, because it was meant to actually be the, the fact that I was going to be showing stuff in, in September. Um, that kind of changed, and I think it kind of puts a different complexion on the work, which I think isn't necessarily a bad thing. Um, anyway, I'll say more about me later on, but I'll hand over to Susanna. Um, yes, yeah, so, you've, well, I've already been introduced, so yeah, I have a very long job title of um, Back from the Brink Project Officer in Rockingham Forest. Um, I'll say more about the project. Um, I'm based here at Fine Shade, luckily, so I'd only had to come from the office next door to get here today, um, but I live actually about 45 minutes away in Leicester. Um, my background is I've worked for quite a lot of wildlife trusts in the past, doing habitat management on reserves and doing education work with children in Ipswich. So quite a few different skills that I've then tried to combine in this one role. Yeah, that's me really. I'd just like to say as well, thank you for all for turning up so close to Christmas. It's great to see you all here. So yeah. 
Okay, so Sir Alice, do you want to talk a bit more in depth about your work over here at the Forest? Yes, yeah, so... Um, Although I'm employed by Butterfly Conservation, the Back from the Brink all involved in having brought this project together um, is a seven different partner organisations, all conservation charities. So you have Plant Life, um, Bug Life, Bat Conservation Trust. Um, I won't be able to see if I can remember them all off the top of my head. Um, there's ARC, which is the Amphibian and Reptile Conservation, RSPB. Um, oh, I can't remember them without my slides in front of me. But anyway, they're all seven different charities. Um, all we're, we're quite used to working on our own species, so all specialists in our species groups. But this is a way of trying to be able to do more work um, so we can get more done across different areas by working on multiple species at the same time. So that's how the whole Rethink Nature was brought together because it's thought that we could do more collectively than we can do as individual organisations. Um, so the Back from the Brink, I, I'm only one project out of 19 different projects that are going on all across the country. Um, so from, from Northumberland, where they're working on pine martins, right down to Cornwall, where they were due to be working on Cornish path moss, but unfortunately Cornish path moss lives in arsenic mines. And so they've had a lot of health and safety issues to be able to actually get that project up and running. Um, and it's only it only lives on like it's about half a square meter in the whole world of this particular moss. Um, so the aim of Back from the Brink is to work on threatened species. So we're all focusing on either one species. Some projects that just have one species like Cornish path moss or you have ladybird spider. Um, narrow-headed ant, all these sort of weird and wonderful creatures. Quite a lot of them are um, invertebrates, which is interesting um, and it might tie in nicely with um, Justin's work. Well, that's what I, I think as well when I see when Justin's work, a lot of that ties in with that. Um, and um, But there's other species, there's seven species, seven projects, sorry, that we're working on multiple species. So we're hoping that by improving the habitats of um, particular areas that will help a number of species to thrive. So in Rockingham Forest, we're working across lots of different sites. There's I think a total of 30 woodlands within that we're working in, focusing our efforts on 11 woodlands because 30 is quite a lot of woodlands to try and work on in a short space of time. Um, the project is four years long, um, so we're about halfway through now. Um, and it's been funded majority by National Lottery, um, plus a number of other People's Postcode Lottery, some other funders have contributed. It's quite a large, for a conservation project, there's a lot of money in it. It's like seven, nearly seven million pounds total, which is unusual for this sort of project, but great for us. Um, so the work in Rockingham, I've got quite a lot of different species. We've got 15 different priority species we're working on. So that includes some bat species that are particular woodland specialists, um, the Barbastel bat and uh, brown longeared. We have um, two plant species, which are slightly unusual because they're more associated with limestone grassland than our sort of clay woodlands that we have around here. But we have a lot of um, places where the limestone comes to the surface. So that's where you tend to find these um, limestone loving plants. And that's a, the fly orchid and basil thyme, very restricted in their distribution. They're only on about two of our sites at the moment. And then we have um, five different bird species, including the very threatened willow tit. Um, marsh tit which is actually quite common in these woodlands we're lucky in northamptonshire that but nationally they're a rare bird um, the lesser spotted woodpecker um, again which has really had massive declines um, recently um, lesser red pole and spotted flycatcher i'm doing well so far i'm trying to remember them all off the top of my head um, and then we have um, the adder um, and in Rockingham Forest, the only site that still has confirmed adder populations of our woodland sites, 
is here at Fine Shade, um, where we have a lot of adders. Um, we're very, very lucky in that respect. Um, and we're trying to see whether they're still existing on some of the other sites. They might still be there, but in very small numbers, which is why they're much harder to see. But it's not great having, although it's great having one healthy population, it's not great for their genetics. If they all just exist in one site, you might get a lot of inbreeding over time. And it also means that we're losing all of our little micro sites. So there's nowhere for these to disperse to. So they might all just get sort of stuck in this one place, although it's a very nice place to be stuck in. Um, and then we have our sort of five Lepidoptera, so our butterflies and moth species. Um, so we have the wood white, which was very exciting this year because I found it in one of our um, woodland sites. It was thought to have sort of been lost from Rockingham area, although it's quite common down in, um, well, not quite common. They've got some heather in Northamptonshire. Um, but it's very exciting. And I know a lot of white butterflies probably look the same to most people, but this is a very nice white butterfly and it has rounded wings and the male and female do this amazing courtship dance where the male sits opposite the female and waggles her head, waggles his head back and forth with his proboscis extended. And I saw that happening as well. So that was really exciting. Um, and then we have the dingy and grizzled skippers. Um, and the concolorous moth, which is not the most exciting looking moth, it's quite beige, but it is, again, it's a, quite a rarity nationally, um, but we have good populations in certain areas and Fine Shade's another one where we're lucky enough to have good populations, but it sort of also is in the Cambridgeshire fens and things like that, but this is a real heartland for the species and mothers will come to this area just to see this one particular species. And finally, we have um, the checkered skipper butterfly, which is sort of the headline grabbing species of my project um, because it is the one that became extinct in, um, in England. There are still populations in Scotland um, up near Fort William. Um, but it hasn't been in England since 19, well, it was declared extinct in 1976. Um, and Rockingham Forest used to be one of the areas where it was um, very well known from and used to have good populations here. But when they started doing some research in the early 70s, when they noticed it had started disappearing, um, they suddenly realised how much it had declined. And then two, sort of two years later in 75, it was the last known record. And that was just over the border into Rutland. So it sort of declined very quickly and by the time they noticed it, it was too late to try and find out what was going on and do anything about it. So in woodland management, so in, um, which probably stems from the war. So the Second World War is that then a, woodland, a lot of woodland management ceased after the war. You got no, no coppicing going on. A lot of the forests became much more much darker and overgrown and then also you've got a lot of um, plantations sort of pine being planted. So those factors are likely to have contributed to the decline of the checkered skipper because um, it likes sort of the sunny the rides so the wide open pathways in woodlands like a lot of the butterfly species they really like that habitat and um, so is that sort of got overgrown and dark that meant that there wasn't the suitable conditions for them anymore. I just thought you'd like might like to see a picture of the checkered skipper so you can see what it's like. I will pass pass that around or hold it up. Um, so it's a very pretty butterfly um, and it's got a beautiful sort of brown body with these sort of orangey gold markings on. But this is actually how big it is. So you can see it's a very tiny butterfly. If any of you know any of the other skippers, it is, um, it's, you know, similar size to those and they're very fast flying. So it can make them quite tricky to follow through the woodlands when you're going after them. I just thought like pictures up. Um, the other really thing that I love about skippers is um, 
how they feed and where they live. So I will pass this round, but the larvae make little tubes in the gra on grass. So they will pull together the edges of the tubes using silk and then they sort of live in the tube and then they'll f um, sort of above and below the tube so you can sort of see where the, the um, grass has been eaten away. Um, so when we're looking for the we were looking for because to actually spot the larvae is really tricky because they're green and just blend in with the grass like you know they're little butterflies so they're a little larvae um, but looking for the tubes and the feeding signs is actually a way that we look for them um, and other skippers do that which is can be the challenge I'll pass, it, I'll pass it opposite way so you can see the real life checkered skipper size. Um, so, yeah, to tell you a little bit more about the reintroduction, is um, we did some climate modelling to look at where to get our population of checkered skippers from, and um, we're working with colleagues in Belgium um, to do this work and they modelled particular areas in Belgium and also the Scottish population just to see which region would be best to get them from which was most similar climate here because obviously we want them to have like for like really and also similar types of habitat and um, food plant. So what's really important for butterflies which is something I may not have thought about necessarily when I um, before I started working for butterfly conservation, because you always see the adults and they can, they often will feed on any nectar sources going, so any flowers, they're not so fussy, but it's what the females will lay their eggs on and then what the caterpillars will eat is a lot more, what can restrict their distributions. So the checkered skipper butterfly, another thing is in England, the historical population fed on a type of grass called false brome grass uh, which is a woodland grass species um, but the Scottish population feed on a different type of grass purple moor grass which was another reason that we were looking for somewhere else to source our um, checkered skippers from and so we did get our skippers from Belgium and um, so we reintroduced them earlier this year into a site in Rockingham Forest and um, we collected they're hard to catch, so we, <laughs> we were planning on bringing back 50. Um, we were aiming to bring back 40 females and 10 males. And the reason for bringing back mostly females was they would be uh, already have eggs and they'd be fertile and they would then just lay their eggs everywhere in the woodlands, um, hopefully to hatch um, out and we'd have our own population next year. Um, and then we, brought, we wanted to bring some males back so that they'd have their natural interaction that they would have in the wild so that they, the males make territories and then um, they can attract the females. So that was our plan, um, but we didn't quite manage to catch that many because the females are very good at, they're quite sparse, they don't like, you don't get big clouds of this butterfly, they're quite spread out throughout the woodland. And so to find enough females, and also we don't want to take all of their females because they need to sustain their populations in Belgium as well. So we brought back 32 females in the end and released them into a site. Um, so obviously to be able to release them over here, we need to be confident that the woodland's looking good and it's got the right sort of habitat. So for the last couple of years, there's been a lot of work going on in the woods prior to the project starting, a lot of opening up different rides, making them more sunny um, so that you have the, the right habitats here. And we're continuing that work as part of the project across a number of woodlands. So hopefully the checkered skipper will establish in one woodland and we're going to do a couple more reintroductions, possibly into different sites, maybe into the same site, we're not quite sure yet. And then it naturally, when it builds up a big enough population, it will then spread to another nearby site which has suitable habitat. So our aim is to create like a big network of sites that the skipper can spread into. 
Um, but we're also doing lots of work on the other species as well. It's not all about the chequered skipper. And we're doing a lot of surveying work as well, just finding out what's happening with all of these um, different species. Um, having lots of local people getting volunteers in to help with that because it's a vast number of areas to, to cover. Um, yeah. That's plenty. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Really, really good work. It's great to hear all about it and yeah. you, the advances and you know what you're doing to make this happen. Um, does anyone have any quick questions at this point? I just had a quick one. Um, it's really interesting what you're doing and I just wondered whether you've had to kind of model um, what impact kind of a change in climate so the mm -hmm. I know it's unpredictable but what effects climate change might have on the reintroduction of the species in this area perhaps yeah they did do some of that within the modeling that they did for us in Belgium that they added that in as a factor to look at um, the effect of climate change and rising temperatures and it seemed Unusually, it seemed that rocky and forest would get better uh, with climate change as a more, more suitable. I'm not quite sure if that you don't know how accurate these things are. And the other thing about the checker skipper, it does tend to prefer damp woodlands. And so it's a bit of an unknown because at the moment we're getting, although, you know, it's not necessarily warming, we are getting a lot of milder weather, milder, wetter weather. So maybe that will benefit the checker skipper. It is it's a bit hard to know but they did try some models to look at that because obviously we don't want to bring them back and then four years down the line it's gone because similar problems. Jessica? Okay, um, I just wanted, uh, Susanna, could you um, go into more detail because you mentioned that you feel like your work is connected to the work that uh, Justin has exhibited. Um, I just want to hear more about that really. Yeah, well, I think even when um, James first sent me over a few of the images prior to Justin's work, and I, I only saw the it in, in life today, so it was really exciting. But there's a lot of the imagery in um, that we'll see in Justin's work, I think, is very inverted. It inspires you to think of invertebrates, I think. And the colouring even from the, from the ink that... Um, Justin's produced. I don't want to steal his thunder and I've got no thunder. Tell you <laughs> what he's doing, but I think even the colours. So because obviously the checkered skipper is the brown and the yellow and everything, and even the colours that the the oak galls have produced. I thought that was mm. yeah. I thought that was really interesting mm. and tied in quite well. Yeah, I was just thinking about as well when you were talking about this idea of capturing the butterflies, because I guess. Um, I don't know at what point I actually officially start speaking, but it made it made me it made me think about this idea of capturing images, you know, in a way because part of the process that I was involved in was kind of, in a way, trying to create images. But I almost thought of it more like a process of capturing images, because I didn't know actually what kind of image I was trying to create at the time. It became more evident as I went through the process, but it was almost it was a, it felt like a kind of for me, a kind of magical process of trying to capture something that I didn't know what it was I was trying to capture. Um, so I was just thinking about you trying to capture these things in a very practical way, and me kind of in my in my house in the middle of the woods doing something and thinking, what the hell am I doing? Um, yeah, I thought that. So, the the <laughs> <laughs> so maybe there is a, a similarity. A yeah, what am I doing? This is a sort of professional question, is it? We ask ourselves. Um, are there any more questions for Susanna? That leads into my question was, how did you find the humans? So we mostly went, so we had um, local experts with us, which is very handy because they know the best areas to look for the skippers and also quite, um, we had a lot of their, they were volunteers but they all work in butterfly research so they're all very good, much better than I am at catching butterflies. Um, so, but mostly you just go to the right habitat and areas that you know they frequent and often you would see the males first because they are territorial and they'll sit on top of like stems of grass and stuff looking for the females. Or they look not on first glance, no. You can tell them, supposedly you can tell them by the length of the abdomen can help. And remember how small these are. Um, the patterning's the same. Some people say there's slight different coloration, but 
I think. I think that's quite hard to see. Um, and obviously, over time, the butterflies tend to fade as well. So if you get some late ones, then their colours have faded already. So the length of the abdomen is supposed to be longer in males. Um, and the so in females, it's supposed to be a bit fatter. Um, but the best way is actually their antennae. So in a, it's the base of the clubs of the antennae if you're looking head on to the butterfly. So in the female, they've sort of got a black base and then orange tips, whereas in the male, it's just all orange. And that sounds a bit ridiculous to look at a tiny antennae on a tiny butterfly. But it's not as bad as it sounds. And we, we use, often use these close focusing binoculars. So if you've got a good look at it, you could you can actually see that even just using the binoculars but often obviously you don't necessarily want to spend time trying to look at it and then it's flown off before you've caught it so we would often net it and pop it in a pot and just have a look at it in the pot and then obviously it's much easier to see in the pot as well so um so yeah that's how um so we yeah mostly look for the males but then you'll hopefully find a female skulking around as well I know the answer, but I'd love, to, <laughs> love you to tell people how long the adults live. Oh, not very long. Um, so an individual adult will probably only live about 12 days, 12 to 14 days, so not very long. Um, obviously the flight period, so what we call a butterfly's flight period is when you'll start seeing them and then when you'll see sort of the last ones because you get some that emerge earlier and some that will emerge later. So the window is only really early May to mid-June is when you'd actually see checkered skippers. But obviously, because we were bringing back all ones that had already emerged, we really literally had live ones flying around for two weeks. So not very long. And I was wondering how that might relate to the ephemeral nature of the, uh, of the butterfly uh, and the images that we're going to tell us about later, which mm. are not the same is it or is it i don't know we should be yeah that's it yeah i think i think there is a well i certainly had a, a bit of anxiety about the ephemeral ephemeral nature of the the images because I'd, I, after i'd made the images in the summer i put them away in a in a folio case underneath you know piled on top of each other and i did have a thought one day of i hope they're still there because of course i'd never seen what happened to the ink over time and of course with different kind of mixtures of inks, I was kind of worried about how they might last or how they might disintegrate. And some of them, some of them are quite fragile. Um, some of them that are more kind of um, have got more residue in them. You can actually kind of almost rub them and rub away part of the image. Um, so there is a yeah, there is a sense of it being quite vulnerable, I suppose. I also thought, sorry, of that because you're obviously you've got the industrial nature of your ink with the rust and everything as well and that sort of the man-made part of in the woodland is a, relates to the way that woods were managed as well I think and the sort of the the loss of management you often think of would be a good thing if you stop managing things that they'll just go wild and then that'll be really beneficial but because our landscape has been mm -hmm. so managed over so many years that actually if you do lose all of that managed space that you can that can be really detrimental to wildlife right. so it's interesting i think seeing the sort of industrial background of the woods and how you've brought that into yeah. your work yeah as well. yeah have any of our own sites so we're working with landowners so they might have their own priorities for managing the wood for timber for example um, so we are looking backwards in the sense that in the past they've created these habitats that were really that have become that a lot of wildlife have adapted to and thrived in and if we don't restore some of that we will just end up with a lot of probably dark woodlands that 
for great for some species, but a lot of species will lose because of that. But by restoring some of that type of management, even if it's not in the same way, so coppicing is probably is never going to be like how it was in the past because there's not the products, there's not the market for all the products that they've used for coppicing. Um, so, yeah, so it's different. I'd say different techniques, maybe, but we're trying to restore some of the same types of habitat. I think it'd be a nice point if we walk through to see your work now, Justine. Are we going to do the talk first? Oh, the talk first? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I think do, we'll do that. I think it make, makes more sense maybe if we do. Um, I've got a kind of some images to show that kind of help explain the process and maybe the, the kind of the way in which the work came into being. Um, James is going to assist me with the, the kind of pressing the button. Um, is the light, can the lighting go down at all? Or is it, it's fine if it's, it's not, but create more of a, an atmosphere. Um, so yeah, I'll talk, I'll talk you through the kind of the, the genesis of the, the project. Um, hopefully explain a little bit about the, the decision making that went on. Um, that's good. Um, Normally I can see the images behind me, but I'll, I'll have to try and do it from memory a little bit. Um, but essentially, I think we've already kind of, uh, some of you will have seen the images in the, in the Archer's space already. Um, for the benefit of those who haven't already seen the, the work, all of the images are made use it, using iron gall ink, um, which for those of you who don't know, um, it's a kind of it's a hundreds of years old process of making ink. It's how it was kind of traditionally made Things like the Magna Carta were written in iron gall ink. Essentially, it's the, the reaction between the tannins in the oak tree, which are kind of acid, and, uh, and, and the iron oxide, which creates a dark liquid, essentially. You boil the two things up together like a kind of tea. Um, I didn't come here knowing I was going to do that. I think that's the first important thing to say. Um, James kept pushing me to, uh, you know, James invited me here. In fact, before James invited me, um, when Yasmin was here, she was kind of asking me if, what, was, what, what was I going to be doing while I was here, and I didn't want to kind of be decisive about that. I always like to kind of come to a place, react to a place, find out about a place, and make work in relation to that place. And I guess the more kind of reading and research that I did about the area, I became fascinated about the kind of changing landscape. I was really interested in, in my own personal experience, kind of connecting with the landscape, staying at Sudbury Green Lodge just down the road in, in Furman Woods. And it was that thing of literally reconnecting with the landscape, slow, having to slow down, being in a place where there's no Wi-Fi, being in a place where you know, everything seems to kind of literally um, take on a different kind of pace. And of course, I was doing the residency as well in the summertime when literally those fields are hopping and skipping with life, not all of which I understand because I'm not a kind of naturalist in that kind of way. Um, but from, from me being a young child, I was always really, really connected with, with kind of the living world. And I remember when I started making this project, there was a really important book. My sister's in the audience, she might remember it. It was this book that my mum and dad had of these illustrations of various different species in Europe. And I used to, sp we didn't have the internet, of course, back in that day. And, and it used to be my kind of entertainment often just flicking through this book and just looking at these creatures. And the interesting thing, the illustrations in the book weren't photographs. They were, they were handmade watercolour paintings, but that looked really, really realistic. And I think that was a really interesting thing. It was someone's rendition of these creatures. Um, and also, the, in the interesting thing was that my mom used to press flowers in these books as well. So sometimes you'd come across a page and literally a, a flower would kind of come out. And it was, it was quite a kind of magical thing. I, I remember that. Anyway, I didn't come here thinking about all of that, but those kind of things came up when, when I spent time in, in this place, which um, also very, various other kind of influences came in during my residency time. Um, the title for the um, title for the exhibition again that kind of evolved blood from stone i guess you're all familiar with the, the kind of industry in the area um, i became interested in the whole history of um are we okay 
Ah, that's better. That's better. That's better. Um, I became really interested in uh, the kind of the drag lines that used to kind of help pull back the the topsoil to to expose the iron ore stone, the ironstone in the area. Um, and when I started to kind of look at places like Kirby Hall and realised how close that those quarries had come to various places that I'd kind of been to and not realised there was that kind of history so close to it, it kind of really kind of resonated with me. Um, this was my, when I was staying at Subra Green Lodge, this is my, if you like, my, I use the word my, back garden. But this is, this is literally, um, some of you might recognise this, but this is what summer was like. And of course, it's kind of difficult to remember that now. But this was a big influence when I was, um, when I was doing the residency, the fact that everything felt completely alive. I'm just going to put the light back on a little bit. Sure. Having to play for a live audience and, a, and another and another live audience beyond us. Um, so yeah, I think it was a really important thing that that I stayed in this in this cottage um, in in the woods and having to kind of engage with things. Um, blood from stone, I guess, kind of relates to that idea of like struggling with something, I suppose. But it also you know, when you see the images, hopefully they kind of have this idea of life about them as well. Iron is in your blood. Um, it's part of your kind of, um, part of what keeps you healthy. Um, impressions of life, the second part of the title, was this idea that um, they're not real life, they're not real species, but in a way that they kind of maybe create images that, that kind of might resemble certain kind of species. James, can we go to the next image? I guess when I said I didn't have any idea of what I wanted to do when I came here, I did come here with a kind of ethos and the ethos that I was coming here maybe is encapsulated by these two quotes. And I mentioned that I work at um, Glasgow School of Art. I'm always telling students to kind of, you know, take risks, to go with the flow, to respond to kind of materials that they might be working with. Not to always have a fixed idea of what they're wanting to do, but to be receptive to things. And so in a way that I wanted to take that kind of idea with me on the residency as well. Um, but interestingly, the, the kind of road that leads up to the lodge where I was staying, where I was spending time, this is the kind of the image that most of you would be familiar with on either side of the road, the, the, the forest being managed. And so this idea that, that kind of nature and industry sort of stand in kind of complete opposition and when you come to a place like this, that it is nature, again, that's not necessarily the truth, is it? It's, the, 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 it's not a natural space entirely. It's being managed. It's being looked after. It's being made to look the way that it's being looked, that, that it does look. If, if the lights were slightly dimmer, you'd be able to see as well. Interestingly, I was looking at these images the other day, but where the, where the oak has been cut down, you can see at the top, the top of those logs, you can actually see a kind of black residue, which also is like the, the kind of reaction between the steel and the, the natural bark um, tannins in the, in the tree. Um, James. Um, so the, the, when I was here, I did a lot of research about the kind of industry that had taken place and local industry in Corby, the history of the um, excavation of ironstone. Um, next image. And came across images like this at the um, East Carlton Heritage Centre, which are handmade illustrations in ink of the, the drag line lines, which relate to the different years in which those, the, 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 the landscape was kind of exposed, if that makes sense. So I don't know if you can see, I don't know how good your, your eyesight is, but you'll see different dates. They're essentially date lines on the on the landscape of when those kind of quarries were mined. Um, I found these kind of images incredible. And I think maybe when you look at the work in the exhibition, you might begin to see some of these things coming back into the work. Um, and also in the, this is, this is um, the landscape just behind Kirby Hall. You can actually, when you know it's taken place in those areas, you can actually begin to see it in the landscape 
you see how that the, the landscape has kind of literally been shaped by the industry that's now in a way been taken over again by nature or been replanted and, and in some cases been um, uh, almost been the, uh, conscious attempts been taken to kind of return it back to nature but if you kind of know what's happened there and you begin to read the landscape in a different way certainly when I was here I began to see things that I hadn't initially seen and you can see that the kind of different uh, processes underneath the landscape this is an image that was shown to me by the very friendly woman at um, Kirby Hall who works for English Heritage. This is an aerial shot um, taken by the Ministry of Defence looking down on Kirby Halls and the, and the gardens, the ornate gardens there. And the, the kind of the area that you see as being very pale highlighted area is the, the ironstone quarries at the back of Kirby Hall and you realise how close that that had um, come to the, to the house there. And again, just seeing these kind of things, it's just incredible, I think, incredible images. Um, James, if we go to the next one. Yeah, you'll, you'll see, you'll recognise some of these images. Some of these are taken from East Carlton Heritage Centre. Um, next one. This was a fascinating story, and, and uh, I don't know if you know the story of the, the particular drag line called, that was named Sunju. Um, hands up if you've heard of San, Sunju. Um, you must be locals. <laughs> um, well, Sunju was one of, the, at the time, it was the world's biggest drag line excavator. And it's literally the, the, the bucket um, that, that drags the soil back. It could fit in this room, but you could probably only get two of them in this room. Um, one of them, one of them very similar to Sunju is basically outside East Carlton Heritage Centre to this day. It's a huge big um, cast iron, uh, steel po possibly, um, drag line bucket. Um, you can see the size of this next to the people but this, when, when the quarry that this Sunju had been working on had basically been all uh, well, it kind of it been used up. The, they'd excavated the, the amount of iron ore that they needed from that site. They were wanting to take it to another site. They would worked out it was going to be cheaper to walk it all the way to this other quarry rather than take it apart and then transport it in another way. So they literally walked it across the landscape. So of course, not on roads. And again, this this whole story kind of resonated me, with me because it was. There's an account of it written in a book, which this is the front cover of, that talks about the whole process of literally walking this dragline excavator from one place to another. Um, it took 12 days and they had to do things like take down the, py the electricity pylons in between one site and another. Um, it's an incredible kind of story. It reminded me a little bit of Ted Hughes's um, The Iron Man. I don't know if you've read, read that book. Um, Anyway, next slide, please. This is, a, this is a map of the journey. You can't probably see the detail on it. Um, but well worth anyone who's more interested in this particular story. I haven't got time to go into it in great detail here, but worth, worth looking into. So this is, um, let's go back to basics. When I discovered that what I wanted to work with was the, was the idea of making ink, I had no idea what I wanted to do with the ink. But I did do some kind of early tests, just taking rust and taking um, bark initially from the site outside the house where I was staying, just to kind of make some ink. And again, for me, it was a kind of magical thing. I knew, obviously, people had done it before, of course it would happen. But when, when you see that process of ink kind of happening in front of you, there's a kind of magic to it. And I did get, you know, genuinely kind of excited about it and, you know, tried different kind of uh, recipes of making ink. I tried it with bark. I then tried locating local iron, uh, sorry, locating local um, wasp galls from, from trees, from oak trees in the, in the area. Um, and then I sort of started thinking about this link with industry. So I decided to, instead of using, um, you know, any old iron oxide. I decided to then take it from machine parts and I got permission to, to use the, the rust or take the rust from the machine parts outside East Carlton Heritage Centre. 
And initially, um, I don't know if you can go on to the next slide image. Um, on the left-hand side, as you look at it, you can see the, um, the wasp galls from the oak trees. On the right-hand side is the rust that I began to take from the machinery parts, like the, the big drag line bucket you saw in the previous image. And initially I started to do this really, really carefully, kind of almost like a kind of forensic thing, kind of rubbing I was a bit worried about them, kind of thinking, oh God, he's, just, he's completely destroying our exhibits. And then I discovered when I stepped into the big um, dragline bucket, there were massive bits of iron, you know, iron oxide just so you could take off in big chunks. Um, so I could make much more ink very, in, a, in a much quicker way. James, if you want to go to the next image. Yeah, you can fire through these. These are just give you... So this is, this is making um, the first kind of couple of batches of um, iron gall ink in the, the house in Subra Green Lodge. Um, again, it's kind of a magic thing. You see this black liquid kind of taking shape. Um, next image, please. You can fire through these. And yeah, just collecting different um, wasp galls from different trees, from different places, but all, all in the local area. These were actually ones that I collected from, uh, I've forgotten the name of where East Colton Heritage Centre is. What's the name of the, the house that's there? Kind of in, in the, anyway, from there, these were the ones I... So there are two basic different types of wasp gall. The ones on the left, which are kind of maybe more familiar in terms of ink making, and then the ones on the right, which actually produce, and you'll see in the images that are printed, a more purpley kind of ink. Um, or certainly I see it as purple. Uh, next image, please, James. And I think the interesting thing about, you know, these, these have been, I don't know how long these have been here for, but you can already see that process again nature's taking over. Um, you've got the ivy kind of growing over the top of it, but you've got mosses. Um, and the image maybe some of you have seen from the, from the exhibition itself. When I actually went to take, um, this is me with my forensic tools, taking the rust off in, a, in earnest. Um, but you might have seen the image online of the, of the moth on the drag line. Um, for me, it was this, uh, this idea again of like, you know, it was, for me, it was like a lovely sign that I was there taking the rust off this old piece of machinery. And I turned around and there was this moth on the, on the thing that I was taking uh, the rust from. And, uh, and I guess I assumed that the moth was uh, kind of camouflaging itself against the rust. Maybe it thought it was on a, I don't know, Suzanne is much better qualified to kind of t talk about these things. But in my head, as someone who had been kind of interested in camouflaging in previous work, I kind of saw it in its kind of natural habitat, camouflaged against the surface of the steel um, bucket. These were kind of some of the ex early experiments, just making different kinds of ink, um, just using kind of iron oxide on its own as a kind of ink, and then gradually mixing it with different types of, um, different strengths of tannin and different types of tannin from different kinds of wasp gall. Uh, next image, please, James. And this is the, the kind of the, the, uh, the studio shot, if you like, on the kitchen table at Sobra Green Lodge, just playing around with these images. And I guess the important thing to say is that going back to the early idea of not knowing what I was doing, I did know I wanted to make ink at one point, but I didn't know what I was going to do with the ink. Um, and I started playing around with it. And then one day I kind of decided to, you know, I kind of knew about Rorschach's ink blot tests, which I'm sure a lot of you know in, in terms of psych psychiatric testing. Um, I thought, well, I'll do some printing. And I started some very basic printing kind of techniques. And one, you know, after three or four different attempts, the kind of, for me, the kind of magic happened. One day I was kind of folding a bit of paper over and, so, and I opened it up again and there was like, well, what I saw as an insect. Um, and there was the, the first couple of prints that it, there was an insect, there was a, there was a butterfly. And, and again, the weird thing was, there I was in this house on my own, having spent a lot of time on my own, surrounded by all of these insects. And, and again, there was a weird sense of not knowing whether I was just imagining whether I was seeing something or whether if someone else looked at this thing, someone else would recognise what I saw. And so there's an interesting kind of process going on um, and again, it's great for you all to be here because I'm kind of interested to see what other people see in the images. Uh, 
Again, this is a, just a quick kind of demonstration of the process, putting some ink on in a kind of slightly kamikaze way, folding the page over and then folding it on top of itself. And then you can't see maybe the detail in this, but it's just an early effort to kind of get some kind of impression. Um, next image, please, James. And yeah, this is the image I, I kind of talked about earlier when I went to get some of the rust from uh, East Carlton Heritage Centre. This wonderful moment. Um, and I do, I do respond to what I see as being signs. You know, you follow your nose, you, you take risks, you don't know what's going to happen. But I think when you kind of are very obsessed and focused on a particular thing, you pick up on things that happen and they do in a way mean a lot more to you. And I think when I saw this moth there, I was like, okay, I'm on the right track here. Um, and again, these are just some of the early kind of prints that I made, uh, not in any great detail in the, in the projection, but you'll see them better firsthand. Would we be able to go see some of the work? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. I don't know if there's many, you can probably just fire through to the end, James. I oh, just to, just to kind of cap off, Again, when I, was, when I kind of became more aware of what I was doing, I thought, okay, I've got these images, they're something. Um, but then I, through kind of reading about, uh, I guess, the, the, you know, the local area, I guess I found out about Darwin's beetle box being kept at Cambridge University. And again, if any, anyone hasn't seen that, it's well worth having a look at. It's his collection of beetles that he kind of took from the local area when he was an undergraduate student. Allegedly, he spent more time going off to collect beetles for his, for his collection rather than going to lectures at the university. But it's an incredible thing. If you go to the next image, um, again, you've got this real sense of it being someone's kind of personal collection. And I guess when I've started to think about these images being displayed, I did think about them in a kind of taxonomical kind of configuration rather than being on the, on the wall like an image. I wanted them maybe to to be looked down on almost as if they were actually a real thing or an impression of a real thing. Um, and again, the, the, and then the magic thing for me, and again, it's a lovely, lovely opportunity I've had here and I'd like to thank everyone who's helped me um, make this happen, um, particularly James. Um, but the, the magic thing for putting the exhibition together was that I had two days to put all the prints into the arches space. And it's really the first time that I'd seen everything come together, you know, because I had this was a mock up I did in the house, but I had only had enough room in the in the in the in the study to literally do one table and the six tables over the over the road. And it was making the, the thing come together in that space and kind of literally composing the, the different configuration of images that in themselves hopefully have a, a bit of a conversation. Um, James next. We can stop there, but I'd just like to say, <coughs> maybe this maybe this will happen sometime. I'd like to do something at Kirby Hall. Um, I think it's got a real special kind of, it's got a special kind of sense to it, that place. And I, th I can see something maybe happening in the future, but I won't say any more about that. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Justin. Yeah. This is maybe about half, if, if that, half of the images that were made while I was here. And these are some of the ones that I kind of then selected. There's another, there's another kind of half in a way that kind of ended up in the bin. Um, and it's that process of just, ha you know, just making and making and, and kind of gradually kind of tweaking things. And, and if I saw something in them, I would kind of take them and put them aside. Um, if I didn't see anything in them, I'd maybe put them aside and then come back to them later. Uh, but I'll let everyone kind of have a wander around, but maybe just to say that the way I could kind of saw the, saw the exhibition in a way was that the idea that people would be confronted by the images initially and they would maybe just, you know, respond to them, look at them. And there's a kind of selection of things in a way here that mirror the kind of process that I went through. So in a way, it's a kind of testing process. Some of the images you saw in the presentation, 
initially testing the inks. Um, when I, as I said earlier, I can do this. It's, it's my stuff. But um, again, when, when I when I had the ink initially, I didn't know what I was going to do. So when I was in the house, again, because I was on my own, very much on my own, in my head a lot of the time. Um, the only things in the house, apart from me, were like insects, you know. And, and a couple of nights, I'd kind of, I'd hear this noise, and I heard it again. And it's like it was a beetle on the ground, and I could actually hear it walking across the ground. And again, that's the thing you kind of tune into things in a completely different way. So this was the beetle I shared the house with, <laughs> and I think it's called the churchyard beetle. Um, I kind of looked it up in that book that I talked about earlier. But again, I, I started making images just of the insects that were in the house in a kind of literal way to begin with, kind of trying to do my own kind of versions of what they looked like. Um, there were also lots and lots of spiders in the, in the, in the cottage, lots of them. <laughs> um, and again, I did lots of drawings of them as well. But, um, and again, they kind of morphed into these more abstract versions of the, of the insects. Um, there was a kind, of, a kind of fluid movement into those. And I guess the rest of the stuff here is just represents the kind of things that, um, in a way, embody my kind of experience being here. One of the things I found really interesting, and again, I'm going to ask Susanna about this, because this is just a hunch, that when I was walking around the woods, often I would kind of be walking around or sometimes running around, and I'd come across these little bundles of grass, like this, on the path. And I'm sure and maybe I'll find out that this is what the lepidopterists leave on the path when they spotted something, because there are often lots of people kind of going around, um, you know, obviously looking at insects, looking at, I'm assuming, butterflies. Um, and I then started noticing all these little bundles. And then so after the kind of butterfly season was over, I kind of then started collecting these, because in a way these were like, um, in my own head, kind of magic kind of, signposts for where things were. Um, but they were just left on the ground, just like it that. It might be that wood, because you're at Firm in Wood, and it's a very well-known site for seeing purple emperor. Yeah. Yeah. And you get hundreds of people, and they will often try and put things like banana down, things yeah. that the butterflies will come down to the ground, because they otherwise they tend to fly up quite high. But they will often yeah. come down for the salts and minerals which they can get from poo as well, so they'll yeah. often find them on animal poo. Um, but um, I, I don't know what they are, but maybe that is, I've not, I've not visited Furman at peak time, but they could have, they might have dipped them in syrup, or you know, it might be sugar or something yeah. on them to help it again to attract the butterflies I did mention it But to it's slightly else. unusual wood firming for that yeah. sort of thing, because you do get people that are desperate to get a photograph of the Purple Emperor, and they mm. will use all these methods to bring them down to the ground. So I said it to someone else and they said, no, it's just maybe it's Blair Witch Project. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> um, <coughs> but yeah, I don't know. I mean, if there's any questions, I mean, obviously... Uh, I, I just I had one thought when I was looking at the... Um, when you were showing the slides, those drag lines you were showing, the dates... Mm -hmm. It kind of really reminds me of that then you'd like you get the rings of the tree as it yeah. kind of matures and grows and it's just it's so many things, thought processes, I can just see how it all pulls together and ties together. And yeah. It's really lovely. It's almost like it, it's a real privilege to sort of be here the journey that you went on and I can just see that. It's really mm -hmm. a privilege yeah. to, mm -hmm. to just hear you talk and see that. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, was there a similar process, because obviously there was a lot of thought going behind the ink that you choose, but was there a similar process to like what paper you would use and whether that would be as attached to the landscape or was it almost just what you yeah. had with you at the time? The, the paper is a kind of complete mishmash of different paper. Um, I did have some paper with me when I, when I started the residency and it was kind of, you know, the, the kind of traditional kind of high quality paper, but I found actually it wasn't necessarily the best paper for doing the prints. Um, you get a particular type of quality in some of the kind of art paper, which is maybe a kind of more dense kind of image. But actually some of the, you can't see it there, but maybe some of the, mm, actually it's on, it's on these ones up here, I'm going to kind of move around. On the, on the table where um, 
think it's up here. Let's have a quick look. Yeah, some of, the, some of this paper that is actually cheaper paper, the, the ink moves across the paper and doesn't get absorbed by the paper so quickly. So you get a kind of more uh, chance-like effect happening. It's less easy to control, but it kind of creates kind of different types of image. Um, so yeah, it was, a, it was a kind of mishmash of different paper, and in a way, because I wanted the, the work to look like a collection that might have accumulated over time, I didn't want it to be kind of uniform, I wanted it to have an impression of, um, almost like it was someone else's collection, not mine, it like belonged to someone else, and I just found it. I was interested in your mention of taxonomy, because um, that's another way almost of um, managing and ordering nature, <coughs> like the quarries, the dragonflies, and the gardens at Kirby Hall as well. Yeah. So I wondered whether in this display you were kind of conscious of that. And I noticed one thing that's different from taxonomy is that you're not given anything, or I'm not aware of, you're not given anything names or labels. Yeah, or yeah. Um, there's a couple of questions in there, isn't there? I did think about kind of giving things names and labels and numbers and things, um, uh, and I did I did kind of tentatively kind of experiment with with it a little bit. The only the only time you'll see names or labels in in the exhibition <coughs> is actually on the kind of process kind of you'll you'll see kind of notes towards kind of different things. In a way, it's like me trying to track what the different recipes were for different things. Um, but in terms of taxonomy. I was very, I mean, in a way I'm kind of very conscious of the fact that, and I guess it's even more the case now that this is an exhibition in the winter time, and I was talking to James the other day that in a way this feels like, whereas I was making the work in the summer and everything was alive, it feels like this is everything that's dead. Even, even the fact that it's a really cold space and all of the things are kind of lying there. Um, again, it's kind of maybe a kind of question for me that, do, do other people get that sense of it being kind of slightly morbid? I mean, in, in a way, the title kind of impressions of life, but actually, is it actually impressions of death? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> no, I quite like it, I think, because some of the things, they look like they're flying and things like that, and I think it does give an impression of things that are alive still, yeah, when yeah. of them. Yeah. There's hope still. Yeah, <laughs> there's hope. It'll all come back to life in the spring. <laughs> Yeah, that's a nice thought. Um, would anyone like to sort of fall down a bit and just look at the work for a few minutes? You, met, you mentioned orchids, didn't you? Yes. Because I see these as orchids okay. in my own head. Okay. It's interesting, isn't it? Because I see, yeah. like I saw a hair. Yeah. And I think maybe what you were yeah. Or what you were inspired by. Yeah. So I actually thought. I think you would agree, it's an absolutely amazing exhibition. And I think the more you look, the more you see. And I think it probably needs two or three visits to perhaps be on. Be on your own in there, like you were at a cottage, just yeah. to yeah. yes, just to absorb it all in, to think about the, the processes you went through. So I want to thank Justin and Susanna for a wonderful conversation and talk and presentation and everything. And um, I've just scribbling notes as we went along. Just a few things were coming up: the, the, um, the similarities of the work you do and the things that you discover. Um, and I hope I got this right, but with the, <clears throat> the sun dew taking 12 days to cross the landscape, and was it the male butterfly it only lives for 12 days, so I thought that was nice. <laughs> um, we were talking about the ephemeral quality of your work, um, and worrying that the inks wouldn't last, that you put the, ink, the drawings away or the prints away, and you were worrying that if they were still there or not. Mm. Um, and with sort of the feral quality of, of nature, and if that's going to survive. <coughs> and if the checkered skippers are going <laughs> to... Yes, <laughs> make it next year, that's definitely um, We were talking about, um, actually a lot of the, the downfall is not managing the land, so the loss of management. 
that I think I was picking up from you, Justin, that you were needing to manage the process of this residency by actually not managing at the start, so just seeing what was happening mm. to you, what you were picking up and feeling, and then managing the process of that as you mm. went forward. Tr um, trusting the process. Trusting the process, yeah. Fingers crossed. <laughs> it takes you somewhere. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we were talking about, uh, you were talking about capturing the images, it's sort of a magical process as, mm. as, as you saw them um, develop, I suppose, in a kind of a photographic sense, I think, I was thinking as well. Um, and then we're comparing that with the comparisons of capturing the butterfly, so catching, but also capturing the essence of them and, and how they're doing, and capturing the process of, of their regrowth, I suppose. Um, Justin, you were talking about slowing down while creating the work. Mm. Um, so I was thinking about relating that to slowly tracking the butterflies because you can't rush at them. You've got to be very quiet, a very gentle process. So mm. those similarities work there as to how your embodiment of your presence in, in the landscape, you, ha you have to think about that in order to, mm. to do both of, of your jobs. Mm. Um, I just wondered if anyone had a couple of small things to say or comments or small questions. We've got a couple of minutes. No, you all <laughs> seem to relax and amazed. So um, thank you again. Uh, I just want to say that the exhibition is open for the next few months. So do come back and see it. Um, and if anyone hasn't seen it, because it just opened, uh, anyone interested in the history of the area, ink processes, sensitive imagery, zoology, John Clare, so I'm very interested to talk to you about that, Rockingham Forest and the important work that's going on, please do come and visit the show. Um, and you'll also be able to see it online on our YouTube channel, so when Martin's finished editing, it'll go on there. Um, I'd like you to say, I'd like to say thank you for all coming, people watching online, thanks to Martin, the Arts Council, Forestry Commission, the Fall Foundation, Corby Borough Council, East Carlton Park, Corby Library Archives and Glasgow School of Art, and also Back to the Brink, who are funded by the Heritage Lottery Fund and, 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 and the Browns Cafe here at Fine State. Thank you for them. You're not funded by them, but thank <laughs> you. <laughs> and it's back from the brink. <laughs> I could read all my writing <laughs> Back from the brink. It is, it's fine. It's, we it's don't want to go back to the brink. No, we don't, but from, from, from you're not the first to make <laughs> that mistake, so it's slightly unfortunate name, I think. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you.